Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, everyone. Uh, welcome today. And um, what I'm going to be talking a little bit about, I'm not going to go too heavily into cyber security um, because oh, right down into the layers, I'm going to talk about what we're talking about with business board directors and CEOs. And um, recently, um, we seen, I'll just move along a little bit here. Cybersecurity has been around since IT. And originally, uh, as I said, I've been in the industry for 40 years now in telecommunications and IT and security. And it's always been around. Originally, all we used to do was protect um, institutions that were financial institutions, government institutions, because it was basically information that was going to be protected or stolen was going to be between countries and companies, intellectual knowledge and any um, information that countries could use to use against one another. But in the last 10 years, because of um, smart devices and people now putting all of their personal information and using apps to access that information, it's now become quite um, important to protect that information because it, to a hacker, um, your personal information is more valuable than gold at the moment on the open market. So, and what governments did or had to do was that the financial institutions like banks, for example, were being hit every day and they would simply pay out the ransomware rather than make it aware to the community that certain things were happening in our industry, certain types of ransomware were coming out that could affect anybody, they would simply just deal with it in the best way they could and keep it quiet because they didn't have to tell anybody. There was no legislation or compliance to say that they needed to tell anyone outside their organisation that they'd suffered, suffered a cyber breach. The same with any other business, small business, mid-sized business, there was no their IT people or IT organisation would simply take care of the issue. And what that meant was that governments didn't have a handle on what was happening in the industry. They didn't have a handle on um, who was out there, why were they taking the information, what were they using it for, and how was it affecting ec economics of countries right? and businesses. So what they did in Europe, in uh, the US and now Australia, they've brought out compliances that require organisations to report any cyber breaches to the, of loss of P2 data, PCI data, and health information. So information that belongs to you, basically, needs to be reported to, in Australia, I'll just talk about Australia, the Office of uh, the Information Commissioner. So if there's a breach that involves um, the loss of P2 data, which is your name, address, date of birth, PCI data, which is your financial information, or your health information, must be reported to the commissioner in a certain time frame. And then they must also put into place or provide the commissioner why, what they've got in place to stop it happening again, and what the effect was um, on that loss of data. And then there's a whole process that the directors have to go through, or the company has to go through, to report that breach to their customers, to their vendors. So you can see that it's now, I suppose, quite embarrassing for organisations to suffer a breach where they now have to go out to their entire vendors, all their vendors, all their customers, in a certain format to report to them that they need to change everything about their personal details. So they need to change their credit card details. They need to change all their usernames and passwords that they've subscribed to on different sites. And that's a big, that's a big ask, right? So, um, so directors of themselves, company directors, um, I'm a fellow of the Institute of Company Directors in Australia. Um, I joined in about the mid 90s when they first started. And they have a graduate course in um, basically corporations law, which is a diploma course that teaches business people who are directors in their own businesses, what they need to be aware of from across the board as being a company director from all compliance types, not just cyber security. And a lot of directors, um, you know, they can steal from the shareholders, they can steal from the company, 
and they're subject to common law, you know, for, for stealing that if they get caught, right, and they go to jail and generally they don't chase the money. If you're culpably liable as a director, then they can, they can go right down through your whole ownership of anything, all your assets, and they can take your assets, recoup the monies that they need to, to pay for the losses due to culpability. Now, when you tell a director or a chairman of an ASX listed company or any company that, that they are now culpably liable for breaches under the Act, they are now interested in solving the cyber security issue in their organisation, right? Because they are now liable, right? Sure, and that's not the main reason. They're there to protect their business as well. But um, now they need to know more about cyber security. And their IT people, um, welcome the fact, because it's not a finger pointing exercise about that their IT people haven't done their job properly. That's not the case, because it's about making their, the decision makers in their business aware that their staff are doing everything they possibly can that is available to them in the industry. What we always tell every company, that we, there is no guarantee against any hacker attacking their business. It's not possible because a good um, layer two, layer three, layer four hacker who knows machine language and, um, and, uh, and can hack a network at a console layer um, is unstoppable, right? So, um, and especially if they're being trained by the military, most of these, most of anybody who comes from a long line of cybersecurity training um, would have been trained in um, machine language level training, um, assembler-based coding, basically. And if you're trained in assembler-based, that's machine language, you can read the machine language, you can change the elements of the hardware through coding. So whilst you have um, companies protecting the perimeter, protecting the infrastructure, protect protecting endpoint, protecting databases, the most vulnerable asset in the NAT network now is the person sitting at the keyboard, right? So the person sitting at the keyboard is where hackers attack now. Why would I sit there and spend my time at a machine language layer attacking the vulnerabilities in a network when I can simply send out an email and have Stephen just click on a link and I'm in? And I can send thousands, hundreds and thousands of these things out simultaneously simultaneously. And what happens is that the way we test networks, and I'll show this in a minute, I'm going to actually do a demonstration and I've got Stephen's permission to use his email to harvest his credentials and show you how simple it is, right? I'm going to show you a little bit about the dark web, about what's available on the dark web to do with his domain name. I've got his permission, right? So to do that. So uh, I'm not harming his network in any way. So. If you look at that comment up there, it says 97% of all cyber attacks focus on humans and not machines anymore. They still attack machines, but the, most, the easiest and most lucrative way to do it is to attack the human, because the human is more susceptible to um, what's been displayed to them on a screen. It's more believable. They deal with it every day. If they see an email from a trusted friend asking for information, they just simply click on it. Okay. So, so in the OSI model, the seven layer model, it used to be only, we used to only attack the first four layers, right? Now we attack every layer yeah. up to layer seven, right? So, and you're dead right. So what we now have to do is move our thinking strategies. So um, most, most, um, one of, the, one of the best certifications you can have is, and, they, and they've only just recently bought them out, um, a lot of us were trained in the old days in offensive, offensive and offensive pen test attacking, right? And now there are certifications to train people in that, right? So in large organisations where they have mission and critical systems, they really need to employ a person in their business full time who is an offensive pen tester who can see the attacks coming in and, and then move quickly to fight against them, right? Because the fact of the matter is that the different people say, how do we stop this? Well, you can't really stop it because we're all trained the same way. 
It's whether you use your skills for good or bad, right? In any type of industry, right? So um, as soon as the industry comes up with a way to stop it, a particular attack, they quickly move around you because we're all trained the same way. So you're dead right. The, in that area, um, we call that telemetry, right? The Internet of Things is just a new word for telemetry, right? And inside major mining power stations, all that, they use post logic control systems, right? Um, so it's about going back to the days of understanding air gaps, right? What needs to be exposed to the internet, right? So Internet of Things needs to be connected to the internet to, to, to work. So they're going to have to come up with carriers themselves are going to start to have to take more responsibility in ISPs of what information they allowed across their wire or across their airway, right? So the company themselves can only do so much. If the infrastructure themselves are allowing these things to happen in their environments, then um, there's just a lot of work for us to do, right? So, um, so yeah, great question. Yeah, it's um, IoT is going to be a big one because, as you mentioned, um, uh, institutions have been attacked on their telemetry and PLC systems, right? Yeah. So, so getting back to the um, what's driving, I suppose, our industry now from a companies needing to employ people is is compliance. Companies are subject to compliances now, which they must meet, report to governments for. Uh, in Europe, it's the GDPRS, I think, from memory. In, in America, it's Sarbanes-Oxley. So if you're dealing with a company in Australia that is listed on the stock exchange in Europe and a, and a US stock exchange, they're subject to all of the compliances and they have to report on all of them. So, um, yeah, it's keeping us quite busy. So when we talk to boards of directors, and even when we talk to CIOs, um, it's about their security posture now. You'll hear the word security posture. And whilst I say you can protect the perimeter, you can protect the network, you can protect the endpoints, you can protect mobile devices, it's about now training the individual who actually uses all those systems. Because we as engineers, we know our craft, we know what we're talking about, we know how to set these things up, but what the person sitting at the keyboard does with that information, we have no control over. Well, we can administer, we can lock them down as much as we can, but if they are using a mobile device which has containerized corporate information on it, so an example, most directors, I'll talk about directors in companies for example, they may sit on multiple companies. So they're not gonna have multiple devices to talk to those companies. If their organisations are smart, they will containerise their information on their mobile devices using mobile device management tools, right? So what that means is that any applications that belong to the organisations that they sit on boards for that they need to access, like email, for example, or important documents, they put them into containers on the mobile device and they can't be shifted. The information can't be taken out, nothing can be put in. Me as a hacker, I'm not going to attack that, C, that chairman's, I'm going to attack his device, but I'm not going to go after the corporate information through those containers. He's going to have a personal email address on that device, Gmail or something like that. So I'm going to attack it, then get on his device, and then go to his corporate containers. So it's about them being aware that it's just not the company stuff that's got to be protected. It's got to, their personal stuff's got to be protected because They've got their personal stuff on the same devices they use their corporate information on. So, and they weren't aware of these things before because they didn't have to be. They weren't going to get in trouble. Information's been getting stolen from organisations for 30 years. It's just now got to be reported as a compliance. They are now liable for the loss of that information. And they're the decision makers. They're the guys who make funding available to their management to do stuff in the organisation. So when we talk to boards, we talk about these things, right? The ability to protect your network, detect information, and to remediate, remediate it. That's a given. They must be able to do this stuff as a, as, a, as, a, as a first thing. The other things that they then do, have to do, is, um, I'll just jump over that one there. 
So these are all the common things that you'll hear from companies, right? Uh, we don't hold um, customer information. We don't hold health information. Um, our IT people have got it all covered. Um, now, and under the Act, it talks about if a company turns over up to $3 million and or holds P2, PCI or health information and they suffer a breach, they must report it. Now, government agencies will say, oh, we're not subject to the Act. Well, they are. And certain businesses will say, we don't hold any of that information, and they probably don't. But they have a payroll and they have employees. So instantly they hold that information. They think because they've got customers, that this is not about customer information. This is about me who works for a company as an employee, that company losing my personal information. And in the Act, there is a word called, in one of the sentences, that says harm. If the loss of the data from an organisation brings harm to an individual, then they're in trouble, right? Now, when I say trouble, fines, all sorts of stuff, right? So they have a responsibility to look after your information um, and protect it as best they can. The other one we hear is that we're in the cloud. And then I shake, like, it's the most vulnerable place you can put stuff, right? Because all you're doing for hackers is you're centralising. They love it. When, when organisation, when the industry centralises information into one place, what do they do? They only got one place to attack, to drag it all out of. So um, moving, as you guys know, because you guys are probably all doing studies in this field, I'm telling you nothing, but you're just shifting data from an on-premise platform into a cloud platform. Doesn't, all it does is um, mean that you don't have to look after it anymore. It's more accessible, you, if your business is shut down because a petrol tanker rolls over at the front, you can log into it from the cloud, all those sorts of things. But it doesn't protect it from a cyber security aspect by default. It still has to be protected the same way you would protect it. You've got to put the measures in the same way as you would if it was on-premise, okay? Um, IT people have got it all under control. They probably have. But what mechanisms do you have in place to test that? Because how do you know that the vendor product that you're putting in place, and we say this to IT people, right? How do you know that the product that you're putting in place at the edge and in the middle and in the windows and in the back doors and everywhere actually does what it says it can do? Has it been set up to do what it says it can do? And that's why you have external pen testers now, ethical hackers, that sit outside organisations permanently, not quarterly, not every five years like it used to be, permanently on now attacking networks, monitoring externally every piece of infrastructure in their environment so that if somebody inside their network changes something because they've implemented a new application and they need to open up ports, how often, if anyone's worked in the industry, every application vendor who builds a new application and sells it to a customer has a certain specs that they need firewalls to be set to. These ports need to be open. These ports need to be open, right? They think they're the only piece of software on the network. That's how they think, right? And they need this range open. Well, as soon as they open this range, it's gonna get exploited because the hackers are sitting outside the network with the same tools that we use to protect them, they use to monitor as well. As soon as they see a port, that they can exploit, bang, where they go. So we now monitor the edge um, of networks so that if something changes in a firewall by an internal administrator or by another company setting up software and the bots believe that it is a vulnerability to that environment, it will report it to the company to say that port's been open, you don't have a vulnerability. Or it will even stop the person from changing the config. Depends on what the company wants done. So if the bot thinks that nah, this is dangerous, it won't let the config be saved. It will report back to the company and say, somebody's trying to make a change in this device. They'll come back to us and say, we need to do this because XYZ company that we're buying the software off wants these ports open. We then sit with them and say, which port do you actually need open? Well, we actually only need this one, but to be safe, we open 
this much. So you've got to really drill down now and only open the ports that need to be opened. Right? So, um, and in the past, you could get away with that sort of stuff because if you got hacked, you got hacked. You fixed it. But now, it has to be reported. Um, from a, the most lucrative part for a hacker these days is small business and mid-sized businesses. Sure, the big end of town is great as well, but small business don't have the, the resources or the money to do the same as large businesses do. So now organised cyber security companies are coming out with new ways to provide the same services to small businesses as they would for corporations. Corporations would normally spend several millions of dollars buying their own product and implementing it. Organisations now, like ourselves, provide what we call um, consumption-based licensing. We actually build the systems in the cloud and sell them to small business on a licensed base. So they can have the same solutions as the big fellas do as well. They just don't have to buy it all up front. They just pay it per license. They turn it on and off as they need it, okay? Um, so that's how we're, that's, that's, that's the sort of, that's what the commercial world in IT, that's their approach to small and mid-sized businesses now. Not only to small and mid-sized, but large corporations are taking up the same offer. Why would they buy, no one buys hardware and infrastructure anymore. It's, it's you just buy licenses and you consume it out of the cloud, right? Um, and it doesn't ha we have another term called on-premise cloud. On-premise cloud means that the infrastructure is on-premise. It's just not owned by the company. It's owned by a provider. So, and it provides a, a like an air gap, basically, to some extent. Um, the risk to businesses now, um, if they suffer a breach, their insurances go up, their reputation is pretty well shot, um, affects their revenue. All of the important things to corporations, right? Most companies don't care about IT. They don't care about cyber. They build boats or they build houses or they build, well, they're plumbers or whatever, right? Technology is a tool they use to help them. They are now seeing technology as a hindrance to them. Cyber breaches, compliances, all of the value adds that they've been preached to for years about technology is now becoming a boat anchor for them, right? So we in the industry have got to change that attitude, right? Sure, it's not a, we're not going out there to directors to scare them and say, you've got to do these things, ha ha. You've got to pay us to fix things now. You've got to do all this. Um, that's not how they view it. You certainly see it in some way, but they do know that they need technology to keep their businesses running. They're now seeing it as a cost and a risk, not as a value add, right? So they're the things that we've got to get across to the corporate world that um, certainly nothing is 100% protectable that it, because you're not telling them the truth, right? Sure, even if you air gap environments, uh, air gap, you probably all know what that means. It's just not internet, in, it's not connected outside their organisation. There's no internet connectivity, there's nothing. The systems just run there. But they can be hacked as well. You go back to the old, they just revert back to the old ways that they used to do things with social, approaching people who work for the organisations, befriending them, getting, play tennis with them, and then get information from them that way, or give them a thumb drive. Many instances that we get called in to do root cause analysis, unfortunately. Root cause analysis of why a company has been breached, how it's been breached, and is the hacker still in the network? And one of the big ones was where you go, to, you go to events where they give away thumb drives. Every vendor gives away thumb drives. Well, this organisation, this hacker planted them within this organisation everywhere where people just picked them up, took them, plugged them in. It was, had ransomware all over it. So um, you'll often see people pick them up in elevators, out on the street. What's the first thing they do when they go back to work? I wonder what's on this. Plug it straight in their computer on their on their com in their work environment. Yes. How do you manage supply chain poisoning? How do you manage what? Supply chain poisoning. 
supply chain poisoning. Well, it's just the same way as you manage any, any data coming into organisation. It's, it's subject to the same cyber. When you bring, um, it's B2B business, right? How you're, how you're managing the communications between those two parties, right? So there's got to be policies in place on your side for cyber security and how you deal with a third party chain. And you've got to then, as a business, if you're running your, in your compliance side of your business, whoever you do business with, You've got to go and physically go and see them and ask them to see their policies on how they deal with your data, other people's data, and how they send it to you, right? So the other common, um, I suppose, misnomer of um, a lot of corporations is they think that if they outsource the management of their data to companies like us and they've got it in the cloud with one of the major cloud providers, I won't mention any vendor names, but you can all guess who they may be. If they suffer a breach, it is still the responsibility of the company that owns the data. It's not their problem. They've still got to report it, but it's still the company who owns the data, who's using outsourced services, can't say, well, it's their fault, they're responsible for it, we're not going to report it, because guess what? All the data and the information and everything still belongs to that company, okay? So they both have to report it, right? Um, so, yeah, it's pretty important that, um, and we're getting that message out there, right, to the businesses about um, how important it is to protect their environments and how to do it, right? Now, when I was talking about air gap before, um, one of the major ones, I don't know if anyone's ever seen that movie about the gentleman from the CIA who... The, the way he got his information out of one of the most air-gapped facilities on the planet, right? He got it on a thumb drive. So, um, and you probably know who I'm talking about, right? And he went to another country. But if you want to get the data, it is unprotectable, right? You only got to befriend people, all sorts of stuff. Um, this is the strategy that we put in place for organisations, just as a, as a simple, because you can go, like, once you start looking at government, central eights in Australia, the way we used to do stuff, from a military grade protection for, for, for data, yes, we still follow all of those, and we have to, right, as, as a standard. But the thing is now, there were some gentleman rules in the industry between hackers that you don't do certain things. Those rules have gone out the window. Because anybody can go to um, uh, Onion Land, Onion Land is the dark web term, um, and use a browser like Tor and grab the same tools as I have to deploy um, malware into environments and they can buy that package off the dark web. So now, um, generally in, in the past, there was a certain level that hackers would go to where they would know that they wouldn't go across that certain line because it affected countries and jobs and individuals and people and all sorts of things, right? Now they don't worry about that now. It's all a game. They don't really realise the harm that they're doing to organisations. Well, they do, but it's very lucrative for them. At the end of the day, a hacker wants one thing. Well, there's a few things. They could want to become famous. They could want the money. Or they just want to play havoc in the environment, right? But generally, it's the money. They want the money, right? And some environments that we've seen, uh, recently we've seen in Victoria, um, the medical fraternity, there was a number of hospitals that were recently last week, or the week before, shut down. Due, due to a particular nasty malware or ransomware, which is the REAC, right? REAC is, so what, the way we've been training and we've been trained is to have certain things that we do. Look at email addresses when they're sent out to make sure they're real. Look at URLs on websites, make sure they've got HTTPS, right? They're all great, you've got to still look at those things, but they're all gone out the window now, because hackers can chain, I can, I'm going to do one in a minute, or I'm using somebody's real email. I am that person, right? <coughs> because I've harvested his credentials, right? 
So, but as a but as a but as a fundamental standard, you've still got to teach people that way, right? You've got to get them to be suspicious about everybody. Trust nobody. Don't trust any information that's been sent to you, right? That's basically the end result, right? And it doesn't matter if it's come from your husband, your wife, friend, cousin, whatever. Read the information. If it doesn't sound right, ring them and talk to them. Did you send me this? Do you really want me to lend you 500 bucks? Because you want an air ticket back from London and you run out of money? That's the, that's the common one. And people just give their friends money. And they go, I didn't borrow it off you. So don't trust no information. That's the first thing we tell people, right? You can't. Um, and <clears throat> now we're teaching people or teaching organisation that the most important person to train in their organisation in their, in their road to protecting their organisation against cyber hackers is the person sitting at the keyboard. Train, train, train every day, every week. Send out simulated phishing attacks. Send out training awareness programs. Get them to do quizzes. Evaluate how they're going. Do they understand what they're reading? Do they understand what's being trained to them? That's number one. Number two, of course, is right up there of number one. They've got to have a cyber security posture. Now we're preaching zero trust. 10 years ago, it was best in breed. Buy the best firewall, buy the best infrastructure system, buy the best database protection tool. Now it's zero trust. Buy systems that actually talk to each other. The whole layer seven model they got to talk to each other so that if one part of the network detects an issue in a role that they play, tell all his mates that I've got an issue at my layer, you need to check your stuff. Before, they would never talk to each other. So you may not be getting hacked through the front door, but you're certainly getting hacked in the back door. And now we're doing zero trust stuff where we're saying that you know, you've got to pick a vendor that or an agnostic system that can talk to multiple devices and report logs, right? It is impossible for a systems administrator in any network to be across what's happening in their environment. It's not possible. If there's logs changing in Microsoft, in Linux, in SQL, on routers, those logs are changing all the time. They detect things. They report to their relevant alert systems, right? But they're all different. So now we say to them, you've got to have agnostic SEM systems that it come back, or, that they're monitoring all the logs across every single platform in your environment. Because what happens in operating platforms is they detect things and they write logs. They're not told to do anything else. They just write a log. Somebody's just down dumped um, five terabyte of of a particular database. It's been logged. It's been reported to something. No one's looking at it until such time as they get hacked, then they go back all through the logs and they go, oh yeah, on this date, we had a down or dump. So these things have got to be all real time now. Somebody's got to be looking at them. Somebody's got to be fighting against them. And generally they're offensive pen testing people inside organisations that are big enough to employ those people. And not every organisation can do that, right? Most important, number three, all the systems have got to be kept up to date. Again, there are multiple systems that do this for different platforms. Got to have one platform that does everything. That's constantly updating these things. You've always got to have, you'll see that most organisations will ask for vulnerability scanning to be done externally, internally, unauthorised, authorised. We're now advising companies that they've got to have that always on. Have one that is always on looking at vulnerabilities in the network. Now the vulnerabilities in the network can be human vulnerabilities or vendor-based vulnerabilities. Every vendor of every product brings out patches for their operating platforms or IOSs. As soon as they find out that they have an issue or a vulnerability on one of their platforms, they release what? Updates. And how do you know You've then got to have a system that can go through and check all the updates to make sure that they're relevant updates to your environment. You just don't update because some updates rewrite all your data link li li libraries and half your applications don't work anymore because they've been 
specifically designed for an application. So you've got to have a system that then filters through all the, all of the updates to make sure that when you, do an, when you do an update, you're not going to bring your company down. So there's three things there that are very important and are, are supposed to be done, but are not being done well right? or perfectly. Then the big one, which has not been a big thing in Australia, insurance. In the US, they have cyber insurance. They've had it for a long time. Not many people have it, but it's been available. In Australia, insurance was generally done based on public liability. When Australia was starting to be, when companies were starting to lean back on their insurance companies because they were suffering losses, they were, they were using their public liability insurance to, to sort of support that, right? Insurance companies are saying no more. Companies are now going to have cyber insurance, and it's quite complicated. It's not just one thing. You just can't buy cyber insurance. It covers every aspect of a hack. There are all different elements. Ransomware attacks, um, BEC attacks. So that's business 101, right? So you have insurance. For, businesses have insurances for all sorts of things, right? Um, public liability, oh &S, all sorts of things, right? This is now the same thing. So the people, in, when you buy insurance, you've got to sit with your broker or insurance company and have them explain to you what, what, are the, what are the prerequisites for having this, right? So it's like life insurance, right? You want to get life insurance, they send you off to a doctor to make sure you're not going to fall over tomorrow, right? So they do the same with cyber insurance, right? But you're dead right, there has been, there's been this gap where it's all new in Australia now, right? And companies weren't aware, they thought, well, I had cyber insurance, you didn't tell me I needed a ransomware one or a BEC one or a this one or that one. So you've got to really research um, which is best for your organisation, which one do you want? Our advice is get all of them, right? At the moment, you'd probably want to have all of them, right? Um, but it depends on your, the size of your business, whether you, what your affordability is and all those. It all comes down to money. Everything comes down to money and whether your business can sustain it and support that type of insurance, right? But what we do is recommend. So the only way to get, what we recommend to any organisation is go and talk to your broker, right? We're, we're not insurance. We understand it. We know which we can help them pick which one they should have, but they've got to go through an, a, a, a registered um, insurance company, okay, and get the right information from them, right? And it's very important that they do that, right? Because it's now underpinned by the regulatory policy, as you just said, right? They didn't comply. That insurance company would have got them on not complying with that policy. They would have found some loophole, right? Insurance companies don't like paying money out. They can find a way to get out of it. Not all of them, but some. Um, so they're the, they're the four major things that we talk about. And, and sure, all of those break out, especially two, breaks out in a myriad of different areas, right? Because you're talking about, a, once you talk cyber security and you start talking to, to cyber security engineers, there's a whole different discussion, right? but we use that as a heading, right? The zero trust part, we're really focused on, right? But now we're saying to organisations, um, how do you know that what you have implemented is actually protecting you, right? And they've got to have that tested, right? Sure, they may have the best vendor, and I'm not going to talk vendors, there's a, and they're, all of them do a great job in their fields, right? But the person who put it in, or the person who purchased it, did they understand what they were trying to achieve when they put it in, and is it doing its role? So that's why you have ethical hacking companies sit on the outside and tell them that it hasn't been done properly or it's, or it's A1, right? So they know. So, you know, there's a, there's a few statistics there. So IT providers like us are telling, are telling the world that um, most hacks are occurring um, via phishing emails. Keep it simple. If I'm going to steal from somebody, I'm not going to go to too much effort. I'll do the easy way first, and I'll send an email. And I'll send it to... So when we do a test on a person's uh, network, first thing I'm going to do, they, they bring us in and they say, we want pen testing done, we want vulnerability scanning done. That's all great. I can make lots of money out of doing that. But we'll do the simple stuff first. We'll send an email to your company. Because that will tell me straight away where about the holes are in your network. If I can send an email with a payload of ransomware in it, 
and it gets to his keyboard, everything in that network has failed. Everything. Yes? So obviously these phishing acts are still happening in training. Is training the only way to which you can prevent this? Uh, for sure. Well, that is what we're, that's one of the main things, right? Because we're saying that from every layer of the OSI model, you got your best people and we've got the best tools and everything else, right? But if they aren't configured properly, the last firewall, the most dependable firewall, is the person at the keyboard making a decision on should I click on that or not, right? And they can think. Machines don't think. Not yet, well they do, but you can make them think. But the, the final decision comes down to the person who clicks on that, whatever, right? Because, as I said, hackers are going to use the least path of resistance first, right? Because now with cloud-based mail systems, it may not be going through an infrastructure network, it may be going to a mobile device that's not going via that network. But it's still, if I click on something on that email, I am still inside that network. So the virus or the ransomware is going to use that part to go back out into the network, right? So, so evidently, uh, now even small scale and big site businesses are also focusing on cyber security. You know, yep. the trading is given, but still the stats are not falling down. So yeah. it's a bit of a concern. Because, it's, um, because we're getting better at it, right? Hackers are getting better. That's what I said earlier, is that when, when one part of the industry fixes something, the hacker gets around it because we're all trained the same way. We know we know how to get around it, right? So it's a it's 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 basically a battle. We're at war. It's two armies that are trained in the same academy. Their generals are all trained the same way. This is how we attack and this is how we defend. It's basically that's how it comes down to, right? Yeah. So would you yeah. say that future of IoT would be in a big trouble if if we are going to move forward and we don't get defended? Yeah, there's a, it's a, yeah it, we are. At the moment, it is, it is, as I said earlier, there is a, um, the industry is being clouded by this. Um, a lot of companies are now making decisions or, or holding off on making decisions on, on risk of what, what, you know, if I move into the cloud, if I go here, if I do this, it's going to improve the way we do business, but it's going to, it's going to put us at greater risk, right? Um, so we need to, as an industry, to make the corporate world um, more comfortable that we know that we can protect them. At the moment, we can't, right? We can protect them. We can, it's about making them aware that we can't protect them 100%. Everybody has to play a role. You'll hear most of the commentators in the cyber security world now, they're preaching that we all have a responsibility now, that you don't have to be an IT person because everyone uses, uses a device of some description, technology device, right? And you're making a decision every couple of seconds. Should I bank, should I transfer that money? Should I click on this, should I, you know? Um, and you've got to be comfortable that when you're doing that, that, that you're protected. I can give you some examples. People will talk about 2FA, 3FA. All of those are hackable, but you've got to have them, right? But you, they can be hacked, right? You, um, in the right scenarios, they can be hacked. There was a, if you're in a country where they have dual SIM cards in mobile phones, well, guess what you can do? You can, you can simulate two mobile phone numbers on two different devices. So if I have his credentials, his bank account are credentials, but what I don't have is his two-form factor authentication, then he comes into my world where I can see his mobile, I can mimic his mobile number, and guess what? When I log in using his credentials, I get the two-form factor authentication code. That is he, but I got it too. He's going to go, what the hell? Who's, what's this? What am I getting this for? But his money's already gone. That's what happened to a particular person. Lost millions, euros, within two hours. Yep. Well, he was in a country where they could do duplicated mobile numbers on similar. So in Australia, it's at the moment, it's illegal, right? But in other countries, you can have dual SIM cards. I'm going to let Steve talk about that. I don't want to go in on his AI area, right? Yeah, because, you know, yeah. he stimulated yeah. his CEO's voice. Yeah. That's incredible technology, yeah. but how are we going to prepare for that when we can't even try That's a damn good call question. Or and video call anymore. Yeah. It's getting to the point where 
Um, yeah, you're dead right. There are some technologies that can be you totally, right? Um, they can put you with people, they can make you talk like you, they can make you say things that you're not saying. Um, yeah, it's a good one. Yeah. What's the answer? I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, it's all used to um, defraud people, embarrass people, destroy people, all of those things, right? Um, so, yeah. And so I better be conscious of the time. Stephen's going to rouse on me, so I better... What, how long much more have I got, Steve? I haven't looked at the clock. I better do the simulated attack. We're at 10, are we? Well, I'll do this quickly so they can see that how easy it is to... to um, I'm just going to unplug it at the moment because I don't want you to see. This is very confidential. <laughs> I'm doing air gapping now. So this is the same, as I say, hackers, protectors, white hats, black hats, we all use the same tools. Um, now, Steve has sent me an email, but he doesn't know that, right? I'll just bring it up. Can we see that? I think I've got to go this way, that way. Okay, so the first thing that we train people in and everyone's been trained in and you'll hear it in the, you'll read it in the newspapers, when you're getting an email, check out who sent it to you. And it will always come up and say Steve Elborn, but the domain name will be some fictitious name that you've never heard of, right? But Stephen, is that your real domain name? Is that your real email address? Yep. Yeah, that's you, isn't it? So, so he sent me an email asking me to join his Facebook page. He never sent it. The hacker sent it to me. But it's come from his real email address. How does the hacker done that? Is that possible? Yes. I didn't spoof. I used a hacking tool. Because I already know his email address. I can get anybody's email address. I can get the CEO of Telstra's email address, which I did. I've done this same demonstration. He was having a heart. <laughs> so, organisations need to do reverse DNS to protect from emails being um, sent from non-domain name registered people. So that's one way of getting around it. So if I click on that, and that's going to come up on this screen. Excuse me. Sorry to go into your time. So it brings up Facebook, right? Now, we're trying to look at the URL. That's definitely not Facebook's URL. But I can use Facebook's URL if I change one letter. I can reverse, I can have it Facebook, but put the E in front of the C. And people look at it and they go, no, oh, that's Facebook. Looks like Facebook. But what it has done, it's taking my real credentials and populated it. So if I sent this to a real person I was trying to hack, right, all they're gonna see is this bit, right? Very rarely do they look at the URL. And it's gonna auto-populate their username and password in there and they're just gonna click on it. I'm not gonna do that, so I don't want you to see my real username and password. I'm going to ask someone else to come up here. Sorry that this is not on this keyboard. So, you've been asking all the questions, young lady down the front here. We're going to hack you, okay? Would you mind coming up to my keyboard? Now, please don't put in your real credentials because I'm going to show them, okay? So put a false email address in there and make up a password, but don't tell us in the room what it is, right? So this is what they call uh, credential harvesting, right? This is a pretty simple run-of-the-mill 101 hack that can make a lot of money.
I do this to chairmen in boardrooms and they won't touch the keyboard. <laughs> oh, I'm not putting nothing in here because you show them other stuff, right? No, no, just, just as a test, please. No, 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 I'm not doing it. Right up. Now, we don't want to save that. I'll just, I'll drive that from here. Wherever my mouse is, never. So it's come up and gone, whoops, and it's even spelled wrong and all sorts of stuff, right? So you've just read that and go, oh, that person can't even spell. Is that really Facebook? Um, there's a whole bunch of other stuff on there. Because it's not really Facebook, nothing's going to happen. So then I come back over here. Now you missed you missed this bit happening, but it doesn't matter. Now I'm not going to show you the rest of the tool, I'm just going to show you this bit here, right? This is the tool that the hackers use. So I can see that the email was sent successfully. I can see that the person clicked on it. I can even see that you've been hacked. So I'm going to, and I've done this to 10,000 people, so I'm only going to go and look at the ones that have actually been susceptible, right? And I have to come around here now because I can't see the keyboard. Withering Heights Bronte, 1862. Is that it? Yeah. So simple exercise in credential harvesting, right? Now, rule of thumb, everyone uses the same username and password on everything they use. And when a hacker gets that information, he'll put it into a bot generator and go to, and let it run to every domain, bank, social media site to see if they get a match, that you've actually put that password and username in something else. Nine times out of 10, they get into everything you got, right? Now, one more. What do they do with this information? Two things they can do with this information. They'll either, now yeah, I've got to log back into this one here, excuse me one second, it's two form factor and it times out. This is a very dangerous one. This is a dark web tool that shows us that we do for companies. Um, we're not touching their networks, we're not harming their networks. We're simply looking on the dark web to see if um, there's any information. So when we get called into a company to do root cause analysis, the first thing we look on is the dark web. Have they suffered a compromise in any way? We even, our tools can go right into looking at credit card credentials. So if you, if you gave me your name, I can do a search and bring up your credit card details, right? To see if it's been compromised in any way. We won't do that today because I'm not going to show you that one. That one's very um, confidential. But we do that for all sorts of institutions. We look at, we monitor the front ends of all of their websites. We can even tell if any of their employees or their customers are trying to log onto a site. And if their devices that they're um, logging in with have actual got malware or key loggers on their devices sitting in their home office, wherever they sit, right? Oh, me as a hacker? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Not you as a person being hacked, no. Your information's there publicly for sale. Yeah, yeah, the hacker doesn't want to get caught. And by the way, I'm not a hacker. Um, I'm an ethical hacker. I get paid to protect people. It's a pretty cool, actually. You get paid to hack people's networks legally. Now, some of the tools we use, which I'm not showing here, we use the same tool, just tools as agencies use to protect. Um, it's the same data. It all comes from the same areas, OK? Um, ITIC.com.au, you don't mind if I use that? So what we do is, this is publicly available. It's for sale on the dark web. I'm not harming his network in any way. But what it is showing is people's usernames and passwords. What we do in demonstrations is that we star out the password, because I don't know who you people are, and I don't know who those people are on that screen. I don't want to show you what their username and password is, right? But I can see it on my screen. So um, it even tells me where it came from. I don't show that in this, these environments. I don't show you the ID theft form or anything like that, right? Um, so that's just a simple exercise. What can we do in that organisation? You might say, well, that was 2018, that was a while ago. Doesn't matter, if it's still sitting on the dark web, somebody's getting value from it. They don't remove it until they don't get no value from it no more. What value are they getting from it? They could be using, they're, 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 they're becoming that person to talk to people for whatever reason, to defraud them, to get them to transfer money, to whatever they want to do, right? Um, worst case scenario is they, run bots and log into sites, your network, your home stuff, your banking details. Um, as I say, we have other tools that show us 
all sorts of information that they hold on individuals, including banking details, health information. Um, and we use those tools to tell or corporations or organisations that this is what's happened in your organisation. Because there is a saying, 50% of all companies who report a breach, the other 50% don't know that they've been breached because they haven't, no one's complained to them, they haven't suffered anything inside their network. And the ransomwares of today are so sophisticated because we had a rule that have backups, have offsite backups, have cloud backups. The old rotation that you're trained, everyone's trained in. Father, son, grandfather rotation. Daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, yearly backups. Guess what? The new one, Rurak, which in Russian means gift from God, can sit in your network until the hacker activates it. Guess what, when they activate it? They know your rotation and your backups. They wait 12 months. You can't restore from it because it's sitting in every backup disaster recovery facility that you have. They're getting pretty nasty, right? So there are some systems now that we tell people that when you buy backup solutions or look at backup solutions, look at solutions that do ransomware detection themselves because backup facilities never did that. They relied on every other layer within the network to do their job, layer one through to layer seven. Something else has taken care of this before it's been backed up. Well, it's not, or it can't be, or it isn't. So the backup solutions are now got some vendors are now building ransomware detection within their backup facilities. So now, even if you had backups going back two years and you restore from them, that's pretty bad, eh? Your business is now two years behind. You've lost two years of customer information, health information, banking details. So um, some hacks are a game. A lot of them are very serious. These guys are very sophisticated. These guys aren't sitting in a room with hoods like you see in the shows. These guys are real the real thing, right? And they make, I think it was estimated in the US this year, they've made close to um, 200 million in ransomware. Because the FBI has released an article yesterday in America, which we take most of our stuff from, right? In this country. Law enforcement agencies were saying, do not pay ransomware. Now they're saying, pay the ransomware. 